Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 10th, 2013. Before we begin this week's interview, I want to thank everyone who submitted an essay for the first Econ Talk essay contest. And I want to congratulate the winners, Scott Atherley, Eric Mustin, and Dallas Weaver. You can find their essays at my blog, Cafe Hayek, or using a link from the Econ Talk homepage. The idea for an essay contest came from last week's guest, Doug Lamov, who talked about the power of writing as a way of learning. To stay in touch about future initiatives like this, follow me on Twitter at Econ Talker. E-C-O-N-T-A-L-K-E-R, or like Econ Talk's Facebook page. I also want to thank all of you who wrote in response to my request during the recent interview with Joel Mokir to let me know that you listen to Econ Talk while you're working. Sorry I couldn't respond to, to very many of you. I've received about 150 emails so far just on this topic. It's nice to know that many of you are working while you're um, listening. A little frightening for some of you, but uh, I'll keep your secret quiet. I greatly appreciated your feedback and was delighted to hear what you're doing on the job. Uh, It was fascinating. Now for today's guest. He is Wally Thurman, a William Neal Reynolds Distinguished Professor at North Carolina State University and a senior fellow at the Property and Environmental Research Center. He has written extensively on agricultural economics and natural resources. Wally, welcome to EconTalk. Thank you, Russ. It's a pleasure to be with you. Our topic today is the world of bees beekeepers and the economics of that world. Along the way, we're going to get into some environmental issues such as colony collapse disorder, and I hope we'll talk about the work of Ronald Coase and what that has to do with the world of bees. Now, reading your work, Wally, I realized how little I know about bees. I know that honey comes from bees. Uh, I know bees have something to do with pollinization because I listen to Cole Porter, But that's about it. And one of the things that fascinated me about reading your work is how little I know. Uh, Let's start with what bees and beekeepers do. How does the market for pollinization work uh, and how does it interact with the honey production? It's a a fascinating world and there are a lot of uh, facts to sort of get out there. And let, let me just start with the, the real basics. Uh, bees uh, are uh, a managed insect. They live in colonies. About 30,000 bees uh, will comprise a colony. That'll be almost entirely female half-sister worker bees, uh, one queen bee whose sole job it is to lay eggs, and a few dozen miscellaneous drones whose sole purpose is to inseminate queens from other colonies. So the biological unit is a colony. Uh, individual bees, they only live five or six weeks. A, a queen is an exception. She lives a year or two, but it's the, it's the colony that's the biological unit that, uh, that perpetuates itself. And it's the colony that's managed by beekeepers. So the outputs, the commercially useful economic outputs of a, of a honeybee colony are two. It's honey, which uh, they create, the bees create by collecting nectar from flowering plants. Uh, Then the other output that has become more economically important in recent years is pollination. And so what bees do is they, uh, for their own purposes, they fly from flower to flower and they collect nectar uh, and pollen. And they bring those things back to the colony. Uh, Nectar is is an energy source, high in carbohydrates, whereas uh, the uh, pollen is protein. And they feed that to their baby bees and their worker bees. So in the process of doing all this, they, um, if you manage them correctly, they will produce more honey than they actually consume because they're saving up for the winter and you can harvest this at uh, opportune times and produce honey. And that's one thing that beekeepers do. But then the other thing they do is uh, while they're moving from flower to flower, uh, transferring pollen from plant to plant, they actually pollinate flowering plants. And this is both useful for uh, home gardening. Uh, it's useful for plants in a variety of settings, including agriculture. A lot of agricultural crops require some kind of pollination, and honeybees provide a lot of it in modern modern agriculture. So the two economic inputs are honey and pollination, and uh, 
beekeepers manage these colonies to provide those inputs or outputs rather. So I don't know if this is an answerable question. <clears throat> well, it's an answerable question. I don't know if we know the answer, but what proportion of the bees of North America are in beekeeper hives versus just running while running around loose on their own? It's a great question and gets at some of the history of beekeeping. The answer is about 100%. Now, 100% are in beekeeper. Well, you said it's a managed insect, and you've, I know you uh, compare it to livestock, uh, yes. which is, I think, a useful way to think about it. So you're saying there aren't, when I see a bee in my backyard, it's coming from somewhere? Or am I not uh, seeing a honeybee? Well, but first of all, are you seeing a honeybee or there are native bees? But, but honeybees are fairly distinctive. And if you, you know, if you, it's not hard to train your eye to see a honeybee instead of a bumblebee, which is much larger, or wasps and yellow jackets, which are other things entirely. But if you're seeing a honeybee in your garden, uh, the probability that it is that it comes from a managed beehive that is cared for either by a hobbyist or a commercial beekeeper uh, is close to one. And the, the, the wow. reason for that is, I mean, bees are not native to North America. They came along with European uh, settlers. And uh, they were brought over for their honey-producing potential, not their pollinating activities. And they found North America to be such a hospitable environment that they went native. And uh, feral bee colonies uh, essentially populated ecosystems in North America as European settlers moved across the continent. So when you and I were young, uh, feral bees were everywhere. Uh, so not all bees were managed by uh, commercial beekeepers. And uh, some were managed, and a lot were just out there in the uh, you know, hollow cavities of trees. But in the late 80s, uh, an invasive species called the Varroa mite entered the United States. I think it's native to Thailand. And the Varroa mite is a voracious uh, predator, a, a parasite on bees, and decimated both commercial and feral bee colonies to the point where it essentially eliminated all the feral bee colonies by the mid-90s. Now, beekeepers do things to control varroa mites, uh, as they do to control a lot of diseases and, uh, you know, manage these, uh, as you say, manage livestock uh, for health concerns. But varroa are responsible for wiping out feral colonies. So, and that's that's the biggest problem beekeepers face now is the varroa mite. Although there are there are other other challenges. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into some of those, but I just want to make sure I understand the history. It, before the bee was introduced, the honeybee was introduced into North America. Uh, w w around what time was that? You say with West with European arrival? Yeah, I don't I don't know exactly, and I don't know how well documented it is, but certainly, uh, you know, certainly 17th century sort of uh, time frame. So here's my stupid question: um, you know. How did flowers take care of themselves and fruit in North America before the honeybee got here? Well, there are uh, – I'm not an entomologist, so I don't want to stray far from my knowledge base. But there are uh, hundreds, thousands of insects that pollinate plants. The, and, you know, there are solitary bees that live out in the wild that aren't honeybees. There are flies and, you know, moths. There are bats. There are birds. There are all sorts of things that pollinate. Um, and a lot of plants don't rely on insect uh, or uh, animal pollination uh, at all. It's just the wind pollinates them. Our big staple crops, the grains, are wind pollinated. It's just the, the unique thing about honeybees is they're so easily managed. <laughs> there aren't, think of it, there aren't many insects that you could take 30,000 of them in a box and move them into an almond orchard and reap the benefits of their pollination services. Uh, there are other managed insects, a small number that uh, are much more difficult to manage on a large scale basis, but the, the honeybee is the uh, queen bee, so to speak, of pollination because it's uh, it's easy to manage. So, you can move them around, and that, they pollinate just about anything. That raises two questions. So, what's the advan First question is what's, and I may forget the second, but the first question is, what's the advantage since there are all these there are natural pollination uh, sources? What's the advantage of bringing in bees to to do they improve it? Do they increase it? What's Why would people find that attractive? Why would farmers find that attractive? Yeah, they find it attractive uh, because if, you, they, if they want to intensify agriculture and uh, monocrop, essentially put all the, you know, have a 
acre of nothing but uh, watermelons or, or almonds or whatever, uh, it's, there just isn't enough ambient pollination to rely upon. Now, I say not enough. That's a pretty vague term, and it's it's actually wrong. There's you know things would, would grow and there'd be pollination, but uh, without the introduction of honeybees. But what has evolved is a system where farmers rent the services of uh, beekeepers to bring bees into their fields and orchards, and they find that the yield advantage, the the increase in you know almonds per acre or watermelons per acre from bringing in bees is uh, is well worth uh, what they have to pay the beekeeper, so so they do it. And now let me stretch your entomology knowledge um, mm-hmm. a little bit. So the second question is this: uh, I'm a beekeeper. I put my hive or hives on the back of my truck, and they're in these little boxes, which people have probably seen out in the out in the world. So mm-hmm. they they put their boxes up on the back of a flatbed truck, and they they go to the orchard, the uh, say the almond orchard. Um, how do the bees get home when home has been moved, right? So you don't just let them go and say, thanks a lot. They come back. They make their honey. They do all this other stuff. How do they get home when home is moved? It's the back of a truck. Yeah, well, well, bees are pretty fascinating creatures, and I'm not an entomologist, but I love reading about the biology of bees, and they, they recognize their home. They They forage up to three miles away from that little box looking for pollen and nectar, and they always find their way back home. I say all, always, but if they're if they're sick or disease ridden, they might not. But as a rule, you know, ninety nine percent of the time, they find their way back to that little box. Now, here's a question that you may or may not ask, but is often asked: Is well, how do you move them then? If uh, you know, how do you, how do you keep them in their box when you when you yeah, travel across the country? I didn't think country? of that. They're not locked in, right? They're, it's not sealed. They have to breathe and. But you could, yeah, you that's could, right. You need to keep it open to the somewhat, air. Somewhat. You could put mesh over it, I guess. And they do. Uh, but the the big answer to the practical question of how to move bees is you drive at night. Because bees only fly during the day, and they come back to their hive in the evening. And there they sit. And so that's when you move them. So when you when they wake up and they're in a new field, they know that home is... Uh, is their hive, and they'll return to that hive, and they're, it's, it is pretty remarkable. They don't get lost, but they're— Yeah, Wally, I have to say, I, I think that's not a credible explanation, but since it does happen <laughs> every time, <laughs> evidently, it must be true. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. Do they, it do, is true. They drive at night, but they also uh, adopt your solution. They put uh, mesh over the bees in case they're— uh, Antsy. You know, wayward bees <laughs> want to sneak out of the bedroom window in the middle go, of the night. They want to go partying. Uh do they? Is it darkness that makes them less active, or is it? Do they have a internal clock of some kind? Do okay, you've now I'm you've now you. <laughs> tipped beyond my entomological knowledge. Uh, why exactly they? Have, well, it's it's understandable why they've evolved in this way. That uh, their useful activities out of the hive or during the day, because that's when stuff. they can find the blooms. And what mechanism is it that? Tells them to stay inside. Is it? I mean, darkness sounds like a. I don't know. I'm just wondering if you can fool them. I'm wondering what happens when you go across time zones. We did do a podcast on ants uh, long ago, and we'll put a link up to that. But they obviously have a lot in common because ants and bees, as you said, the real um, unit is the colony, which is an Mm -hmm. incredible example of emergent order. There's no the queen, at least in the ant world, and I assume it's the bee world also. The queen's not in charge. It, it looks that way maybe because the queen's bigger. Or, but the there's this set of forces that link these creatures together in ways that are not controlled. Yes. No, it's uh, – here, here's, uh, here's something for your reading list. There is a Cornell uh, biologist named Tom Seeley who's written several books, one of which is called Honey Bee Democracy that's on these issues about how the internal organization of – Bee colonies, and it's very much an economic kind of explanation. Uh, you really feel a intellectual kinship uh, between economics and and evolutionary ecology when you read his stuff. And uh, he gave a talk one time at NC State, and I went up afterward and said, "Gee, that was great! It really, really piqued my interest." Uh, I said, "I'm an economist." He says, "Are you interested in Hayek?" I said, "Well, <laughs> yeah." As a matter of fact, Strangely he says, enough. "He's my favorite. He's my favorite economist." And that, so it would that be. Led to a 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so getting back to the logistics, uh, what crops are important uh, demanders of honeybee services? The first one that people mention are almonds because – Almonds are uh, the most valuable agricultural product of the state of California. I think that even includes dairy. If, really? Uh, wow. Yeah, it's it's huge. It's mind boggling. Uh, it, it, well, <laughs> I I should. It may not. It may be only the most economically important uh, crop, um, as opposed to animal agriculture. But I, but I think it does even uh, outstrip dairy. And almonds have been developed, and the, the kind of breeds that have been developed over the last several decades have been ones that are highly dependent on honeybee pollination services. Now, that wasn't so much the case decades ago, but now as it stands, the uh, varieties of almonds that are planted and the way they are planted, uh, it is almost true that if you don't put supplementary bee pollination in there, uh, you don't get almonds. It's not literally true, but it's uh, highly dependent. So that's the first that's the first crop that you had mentioned. And uh, acreage has grown over the years, and they've become sort of the uh, – they're important for another reason, actually, and that is that they bloom very early in the year, late February, early March. So that's when honeybees are demanded at a time when most other crops are, are not flowering. So that's one particular crop that's important. But then there are a lot of vegetable and fruits. Uh, blueberries, apples, cranberries, uh, watermelon, squash. Uh, as a as kind of a rule of thumb, it's it's again not the staples of your diet. It's not the wheat, rice, soybeans, and corn that are pollinated by bees. It's uh, fruits and vegetables, the colorful things. And how much money are we talking about here for to? For a particular orchard, obviously it depends on the size of the orchard and how many bees are involved. But what, what's a typical kind of number for how much yeah. money might change hands to show up with your bees? If you take bees into an almond orchard, you might rent them for a 10-day service while the crop is – while the trees are blooming for $150, $175, maybe $200 per colony. You might put two colonies per acre, so three hundred, three hundred fifty dollars an acre uh, is how much the almond grower would pay the beekeeper. A, a little perspective on that is that's going to work out to be not huge in the in the spreadsheet of a of an almond grower, maybe a five or seven percent cost share. So among all the you know, seed and land and well, per anything, yes, yeah. it's uh, he, uh, of all his costs, labor, chemicals, fertilizer, land, et cetera, uh, renting pollination services is going to be, you know, five, ten, seven percent of his costs. What's a big almond orchard? How many acres, maybe? Uh, I, I don't know. There are about 800,000 acres in California. Yeah, well, that's helpful. And, uh, yeah. And that's, uh, I, you know, an individual one I'm sure is several thousand, but I, I'm not sure how how large they get. They aren't, they're not small operations. But that's a lot that's of, for sure. that's a lot of almonds, obviously. Um, they must yeah, be. It, yeah, it's the only place almonds are grown in the United States. We're the biggest uh, producer of almonds in the world. So it's it's a big industry. And how fragmented or concentrated is the the bee colony business? Does, is it 250 or 250? 500 or seven, say, beekeepers showing up in California for those almonds, or is it just a few? Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, very, it's very unconcentrated. Uh, these are primarily uh, ha you know, the, what you think of agricultural enterprises, family businesses. My co-author, Randy Rucker at Montana State, uh, and I have done a lot of work on bees over the years, and – the, the, the question you just asked is not easy to answer, but ballpark 1,500 commercial beekeepers in the United States. And they, you know, have from several hundred to several thousand colonies that they manage. And so they're, they're large if you think in terms of how many bee colonies a small number of, you know, a handful of people can, can manage, but they're, but they're not big businesses. They're not, uh, so the top well, five, the top five don't have half the market, you're saying? 
No, 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 nowhere near. Uh, th- there are no, uh, there are no corporate beekeepers. I mean, corporate farming itself is is rare. That's maybe another conversation. Does, but uh, and, and it's and I think it's really due to the principal agent kind of problems. There's just so much micromanagement and information flow that has to happen in real time that uh, it's these small operations that end up being the economically dominant form. And do any almond growers or watermelon growers have their own bees? Any vertical integration there? Or or Uh, horizontal integration, sorry. uh, Very very little to none. And, you know, one reason for that is is what I just said. The information monitoring demands are, are high. And so, you know, it pays to specialize and transact across markets. But but the other reason is that it makes a lot of economic sense for beekeepers to be migratory because if you think of when crops bloom that require pollinating services, it might be uh, almonds in late February, early March. Uh, that's only 10 days. And so then the next thing happening is maybe up in the Central Valley, a little farther of California, some vegetable seed crop requires pollinating. So as the season progresses going north, uh, what migratory pollinators, beekeepers do is they move their bees on trucks and pollinate, you know, a handful, three or four sets maybe of different crops. Finally, they're up in Washington and Oregon pollinating blueberries or raspberries or cherries. And then their spring activities over, the pollen, you know, the bloom is proceeded north as far as it's going to, and then they truck them out to the sunflower fields of North Dakota for the summer where they where they graze them. And then the this joint output process turns from 100% pollination and generating pollination income to making honey, which is what they do during the summer, uh, not receiving pollination payments, but rather making honey that they extract and sell. So... That was a long-winded answer, but that's why I think you don't see the kind of integration yeah. that might sound natural is that uh, these guys are moving all over the country. In fact, here, here's a factoid that I kind of like. Uh, you asked about the concentration of beekeeping. Well, in terms of geographical concentration, two-thirds of American bees are in the almond orchards in late February, early March. Two-thirds of every bee insect wow. in the country <laughs> – and they come from as far away as North Carolina, where I live. So it's it's at the margin. It's profitable for a North Carolina beekeeper to put his bees on a truck, send them across the continent uh, to get that hundred and fifty, two hundred dollars a colony almond uh, pollination fee. Did did you say there are about thirty thousand bees in a colony? Yeah, at at full strength. And some of these guys have many, many colonies too, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. So it's a big truck or more yeah. than one truck. Picture a semi-trailer, you know, one that you'd see on the freeway, an 18-wheeler, uh, stacked with honeybees, uh, with boxes with hives of honeybees. It'll have about 400 colonies like that. Whoa. And so. On know, one four, truck? Yes. Wow. So when they, um, I just, we're, we're going to get into some some more policy issues in a minute, uh, but this is just so interesting. The image of the bees after their hard work, which of course they don't, they kind of, in, I was going to say they kind of enjoy it. I don't know what enjoy means for a bee, but it's kind of what they're made to do is to fl- go yeah, from you, flower you to flower. You need to interview bees on your, yeah. one of your next podcast <laughs> That's to a good find idea. out how they really feel about this. But they do it naturally is a better way to say it. So they go from California and they go, and then they go up to Oregon and Washington state. And then they go to, which Dakota is it? North Dakota. North Dakota. So they're they're grazing there on sunflowers, just hanging out. Um, A huge portion of those of the bees must be there. It must be. Well, don't uh, I am uh, I'm giving you some some highlights of what is a very complex pattern of migration. Uh, There are. There are bees that, you know, the, the, the typical pattern is their home base will be in some southern state, and then they'll travel north for pollinating, stay up north while the weather's nice and there's nectar up there to be gathered, and then they go back to home base. It happens along the east coast from Florida up to Maine and back. Uh, it 
some of it happens laterally west to east. So it's not true that every beekeeper is following the same pattern. No, but there are uh, a but, lot but, of bees in North Dakota in that month, in that in that period. Just there's something beautiful about that imagery of them just kind of hanging out there. Um, and I wonder if there's some, if there must be a lot of beekeepers who hang out near there and there must be some culture of interaction between them that, that is uh, undocumented perhaps. I don't know. Yeah. Well, there's actually, there's a really good book. Another one that I would, that's on my reading list. Uh, I read it, Hannah Nordhaus, uh, The Beekeeper's Lament. It's about the culture of beekeeping. And her story is an interesting one. She started out, she's a, I would say an environmental journalist, uh, very interested in, you know, environmental implications of agriculture. And she, you know, I talked to her and she started to write uh, what she thought was an expose of, you know, the bees are all dying and it's the the problems with modern chemical agriculture. We're going to turn to that and, topic next. Go ahead. Perfect. Yeah, but she but she ended up, you know, and, and I'm, I don't, don't want to characterize her views on that topic, but she ended up writing a book that was about the sub that, that, that you just asked about is, uh, you know, the, the life of beekeepers uh, up in North Dakota in the summer and tending their bees now. And in fact, they're they're driving all over the place, so they don't just park with their bees. But it, it's a very interesting book and about the evolution of the system and uh, and the culture of driving all night with your bees and waking up in the morning. It's it's kind of a cowboy thing. Yeah, no, the, that the whole idea of having hundreds of thousands of bees on your truck uh, as they're sleeping. So there's something poetic about it. But let's let's move back to the economics. <laughs> Um, there has been a lot of concern in the last uh, few years about what's come to be called colony collapse disorder. And explain what that is and what – first we'll talk about what might be causing it and then we'll talk about how the markets responded to it. So first let's talk about what is it? What do we, th what do we know about it and what's the magnitude and scope of it? Uh, colony collapse disorder as a term first uh, gained currency in about 2007. It's – Beekeepers have always faced diseases of various sorts, uh, and it's, it's usually known what those diseases are. American fowl brood is uh, one, nosema, varroa mites that I mentioned. But in 2007, uh, a mysterious thing happened. A beekeeper uh, by the name of Hackenberg, Pennsylvania beekeeper, takes his bees down to Florida for the winter in this migratory pattern I was talking about. He leaves them for a couple of months. He comes back and he finds that they're, the bees have essentially vanished. So there was no smoking gun. There weren't dead bees lying at the bottom of the hive, as would be true if there were other kinds of uh, known diseases. And beekeepers across the country started reporting instances of this same uh, phenomenon, the same syndrome. And it's uh, a colony collapses, meaning it's no longer viable. And... Most of the adult bees, if not all, have left, leaving a, a few brood of the brood, the baby bees, as well as probably a queen. Uh, and that's colony collapse disorder. And it, I think, gained notoriety, well, for two reasons. One, it, it, it's a real thing. Uh, overwinter mortality is normal in, the, in beekeeping. If you put 100 colonies out for the winter, when you come back in the spring to spruce them up to take them out pollinating, uh, you might have lost 15%, and that would be a pretty standard 20, 30 years ago kind of overwinter mortality rate. We can talk about how beekeepers adjust to that, but let's just say it used to be 15%, and since 2007, with this colony collapse disorder and other problems, overwinter mortality is more like 30%. So it's a real phenomenon. It's a real thing, uh, and it means more bees die over winter. Uh, you know, they're must they're, le they're less healthy for some reason going into the winter dormancy period, and then they come out and the marginal colonies have died. But and is, I, it, I, is it that they've died or disappeared? The first example you gave, they sort of just wandered off, lost their mojo, right? I, yeah. Uh, well, it's uh, – I think colony collapse disorder as currently understood, uh, I should have said disappeared, not died, uh, because that is what uh, – that's what it – that's what the term describes. Now, the, leaving the colony is not entirely unheard of. Uh, bees will swarm if they don't like the environmental conditions or if uh, a 
a hive of bees gets too crowded, and this is actually what that book Honeybee Democracy is all about, uh, if it gets too crowded, they uh, they divide and they create one new queen who flies off with half the bees and the other half stays in the old hive with, with the other queen. So, you know, en masse movements of bees in the air is something that happens. And so from that perspective, uh, disappearing bees is entire, isn't entirely novel, but nobody really knows where they go. They Presumably they're not setting up shop somewhere else and somewhere else and being healthy. So it's, I think that CCD gained notoriety both because it's, you know, it's another challenge the beekeepers face and also it's got this mysterious... Scary. Yeah. Yeah, people don't know and there are all sorts of early theories. You know, well, it's uh, cell phone transmissions. Um, you know, it's aliens. It's, you know, it's, it's all sorts of things. I, I would say, and the, the research community, which I follow pretty closely, uh, still still is at a loss. There are a lot of culprits. Probably the best explanation is a combination of factors, uh, uh, viruses, uh, maybe weakening by insecticides that are applied to crops or applied directly to the colony by beekeepers to control the uh, mentioned previously varroa mites. So a lot of things are coming together here, perhaps. But, uh, no, no single explanation as of yet. Global warming? Uh, that's certainly been mentioned. I'm sure. Yeah. Any evidence for it? Not on that. No, I, I think the evidence is so weak on any one explanatory factor. That there are people who would say that insecticides have now been uh, fingered. Yeah, I, I don't see the evidence for that, but... That's uh, the, you get into the policy realm, and and that that's what you hear most about now, the days. If you're just casually following uh, news sources, is uh, the EU has banned a class of pesticides, insecticides called neonicotinoids, and there are various groups that want that done in the United States, and they motivate the that policy proposal uh, over concern for honeybee health. So whatever the reason, it's a dramatic increase in mortality over the winter, uh, doubling roughly it, compared to historical standards. Mm -hmm. And normally that would cause some concern. Forgetting the <clears throat> – I think the worry – there was an ecological worry that something sinister was going on. Maybe it's the insecticides. Maybe it's global war. Maybe it's something else. But a lot of people thought – and I think – What's interesting about these kind of examples is it's like the frogs. They're, these are small creatures. It's sort of the canary in the coal mine. If something's going wrong here, it could lead to this sort of cascading destructive effect on the ecosystem. And next thing you know, we're not going to have any fruit in America or something like that. I think there's a lot of anxiety about those kind of s seemingly small changes. But assuming that it's not that catastrophic canary in the coal mine kind of uh, phenomenon – it's just something that maybe is transient, transient, maybe it's insecticides, but it hasn't worsened. There's, It's a bad thing, 30 percent dying over there instead of 15. But what's interesting, what you've written about is how markets responded to this effect, which by itself should have had some dramatic effects on a whole bunch of things as just on the, the pure economics of it. How have the honeybee folks, how have the beekeepers responded – to this phenomenon, even though they don't fully understand the cause. Yeah, that, that's been a focus of uh, some recent work that Randy Rucker and I, again, have, have done. We, we had been following honeybees for a while, and, and my initial interest in honeybees came through uh, the honey subsidy program that uh, beekeepers were paid support prices and supplements like for many crops. So I started interest from that angle, became more interested in pollination, and then while I was thinking about economics of bees, uh, colony collapse disorder arose, and Randy and I are talking. So, well, gee, if it's that bad, shouldn't we see, oh, fewer bees, uh, higher prices for pollination rentals? Higher prices and, of honey, higher prices of almonds, higher prices of fewer almonds maybe? Um. Yeah, I mean if you're – you know, the, there should be just purely on an economic uh, – from an economic perspective, you should see evidence of this. So we started looking and 
surprisingly enough, as I speak here today in 2013, we have more bees in America than we did in 2007 before colony collapse disorder was observed and, and named. Uh, there's virtually no effect. There's there's probably been some effect on the price of pollination services, but it's it's not dramatic, and it's probably only for almonds, the very early uh, season crop that is pollinated, not for the other crops that are pollinated the rest of the year. And this was surprising, given given all the discussion of CCD and and honeybee health. And you know how how does this come to be? Well, <laughs> beekeepers manage these colonies and you can take a healthy colony and you can split it. You can buy a, you can purchase a queen from specialized beekeepers who do nothing but produce queen bees. Uh, you buy a queen, you split your bees, uh, you put the new queen plus half of your old bees into a new empty box. Maybe it's the same box that was vacated by uh, a colony that died. And once the queen and the new bees get used to one another in about, oh, six weeks, uh, you have a pretty much full strength colony that you can take out for pollinating and making honey for the season. So it's it's standard practice for beekeepers to do this. It's called making increase or making splits. And that's how they've responded. That's why it's you know, you can do the arithmetic. It's not that difficult to think about how many more splits you'd need to make to compensate for a 30% loss when you're used to a 15% loss. And it seems like that's exactly what beekeepers have done. And so that's maybe not too surprising. I guess what we were a little more surprised at is, well, wouldn't this put some pressure on uh, the queen uh, part of the industry and increase the price of queens? We found there's no been no effect of colony collapse disorder in the prices of queens. So apparently that's a constant cost industry. Explain that, a constant cost industry, meaning? Meaning um, an industry that can produce its product at some constant average and marginal cost. And if demand were to double for that product, there might be a temporary increase in the price of it. But eventually, the industry would, could replicate itself and produce twice as much at the same cost, hence price that it was uh, producing at before. So that could either happen by expansion or by it happens by expansion, but it could happen by just new entrants. It could be just that it's relatively easy to start a queen making business. The technology is understood, and people know how to breed them, et cetera. Right? Yeah, and that's uh, that's a good point. I don't know which of those has happened. Uh, we've we've collected data from the American Bee Journal over uh, the last forty or fifty years on the prices of bees, and you you tend to see the same companies. And so I don't see a lot of turnover in the numbers reflecting new entrants but so it's probably expansion by existing companies but that's a that's a falsifiable claim so the the disorder which is again we don't fully understand it but the immediate economic impact has been cl close to zero is that an accurate statement except for maybe almonds and if so why is that? What's going on in almonds, if you know? And um, it's an amazing thing. It's a beautiful thing because a lot of people say oh, we've got to do something about it. But of course, the beekeepers did something about it. Yeah, that's that summarizes it for me. Now, you know, is it a canary in a coal mine? That's a little hard. It's a little hard to disprove, uh, and it's it's worrisome that that honeybee mortality has risen in this uh, unexplained way. But if you just focus on you know, pocketbook issues of the food supply, uh, consumers shouldn't worry about this at all. It's, it's utterly negligible in, uh, in the, the price of uh, food that they purchase and the availability of food and the variety of food that exists. Now, it's not negligible from the perspective of beekeepers. It's, uh, you know, in the same way that, uh, you know, cattle uh, ranchers have to deal with the uh, diseases that, uh, that afflict cattle and it affects their bottom lines. So beekeepers, have to adjust and and so it's it's a you know, the American Bee Journal is filled with discussions of colony collapse disorder and how it affects the bottom line of beekeepers. Now, in that you asked why would it affect uh, price of pollination services for almonds and not others? I think the explanation there is that 
it's very difficult to get a full strength colony very early in the year, which is what almonds require. If you put your bees down south, uh, they normally start coming out of their winter torpor uh, when it gets warm. Well, it's not very warm when the almond trees are blooming, and so they sort of have to force them out of their uh, out of their winter state to be full strength, and that it puts a real biological stress on colonies that are already weak, and it doesn't give beekeepers much time to engage in that splitting of colonies that I talked about. So you can kind of see that there's some resistance to uh, to expanding the availability of uh, pollinators that early in the season. Uh, but once they're sort of back up to full strength, uh, the costs of providing pollination services to later crops, uh, apples, hasn't really been affected. And so you wouldn't see a pollination fee increase there. So the price of almonds has risen quite dramatically uh, in the last few years. Uh, how much is any of that, some of that a little bit due to the um, to this effect? I, I'm, I know there's an increase in the demand for almonds. Uh, I've read, I think it's true that Increase yeah, that in demand true. for almond milk and other things. Yep. Yep. And um, it, I think that's not due to an increase in pollination fees. Again, uh, I think a, a generous assessment of the importance of pollination to almond growers would be a you know, no more than a 10% cost share. And, and I think more like five or seven is, is a good number. So, you know, if you have a 30% increase in what is a 5 or 7% cost share, well, that's going to make, you know, that, that could make a little bit of a difference in the value of almonds at the farm gate. Now, what is the fraction of the value of a can of Blue Diamond Smokehouse almonds at the store uh, represented by the actual almonds, uh, you know, the Less. You know, the old, the old, <laughs> right, right, not very much. The old saying in agricultural uh, economic circles is, uh, uh, you know, it, there, there isn't much wheat in a box of Wheaties. It's mainly packaging and shipping and processing and all that stuff. And so the cost share of wheat is very small in Wheaties. Marketing, yeah. Yeah, and and so it's so even something like almonds, where you're you think you're buying just almonds. I, I should know this this figure, but I don't. But I would guess that uh, the cost of almonds in a can of uh, consumer almonds purchased at the store is 50%, say. Yeah. So now you got 50% of what consumers buy is the actual almonds, and uh, 5% of almonds is pollination, and pollination fees for almonds go up by 20 30%. There's not much action there. Yeah. No, that's a beautiful back-of-the-envelope calculation that summarizes what the probable impact is. But it, obviously, if the if the beekeepers didn't respond, it would be bigger. <laughs> but but yep. they've mitigated that response uh, throughout all these effects across products, crops, by their natural incentive to try to get access to those pollination demands. So oh, go ahead. No, that's that's a great summary of it. I have nothing to add to that. So, so let's talk about uh, Ronald Coase and James Mead and Stephen Chung. Uh, we actually did mm -hmm. a podcast touching on these issues back in 2008 with Mike Munger, uh, a, a near neighbor of yours at Duke University, I might add. Yes. Uh, in that in the Triangle area of North Carolina, uh, he gave he was talking about uh, the Florida market, but let's step back and and talk about the fundamental economics here. And I want to start with James Mead. James Mead uh, is a Nobel Prize winner uh, who speculated that there would be some problems in the pollination market because of what he called uh, or I think has come to be called reciprocal externalities. And that is that the bees benefit the the apple orchard or the almond orchard. The apple or almond orchard benefits the bees. So it's not obvious to uh, some economists that this market would work very well. And so – that was his original thought, and what happened after that? And did I get that correct? Did I summarize him correctly? Yeah, I think that's right. I, and uh, Francis Bader, I think, popularized his work, uh, but it, it originated with Mead. And uh, no, the story is just what you say. That uh, it's this nice example. It's easy to come up with negative externalities. Positive externalities are a little more difficult. And here's a nice story: you've got apple growers next to beekeepers. 
and uh, the, bee, the bees themselves fly over and they collect nectar from the apples. And so that's helpful for the beekeeper because he produces honey. And while the bees are doing this, they help pollinate apples, and so that produces more apples. So uh, the fact that the apple growers are there enhances the profitability of the beekeepers and vice versa. And, and I should just it, add, just to make it clear, the worry is they're going to free ride, that, that somehow because the bees are flying around – the apple guys can take advantage of the bees and not have to pay for them because, after all, bees are just – who can control them? That's right. Free riding or even uh, you know, a more benign interpretation is uh, these guys might not know of each other. I think that's, that's the story that I get out of Mead and, and uh, Bader is that you know, sort of unbeknownst to each other, this uh, reciprocal external – these benefits are happening. And so then, you know, from a social welfare perspective, you say, well, gee, we should have more apples being grown because not only are apple growers producing apples, they're producing nectar for the bees. And we should also have more bees because not only, only are they producing honey, but they're enhancing the production of apples. Therefore, uh, we should be subsidizing both of these, these industries to get a, to get better, get a better mix of the agricultural, uh, Products. And that's the flip side of the Pagu interpretation of externalities, that when there's too much of something because people's actions have effects on others than just themselves, we need to tax it. And in case of positive externalities, we need to subsidize it. Otherwise, we don't get the right amount. That's right. No, it's exactly the same argument turned on its head due to the positive nature of the externalities. So that was uh, – I don't know when I, if you ever learned that story, but the Bader is the simple analytics of welfare maximization. I remember in master's uh, lovely economic theory classes, I learned that, and it was a nice example of how the market works or doesn't work. Uh, Stephen Chung comes along. He was a student of Ronald Coase's, and I talked to Coase once about this, and Coase encouraged Chung to take on this uh, – this story and see if there's any truth to it. Chung at the time was a professor of economics at the University of Washington. And he did research that ultimately was published as uh, The Fable of the Bees in 1973. And what what he discovered, I'm not sure if Coase's suggestion came first or if just living in Washington State where they grow a lot of apples uh, brought this to, to Chung's attention. But he found that if you went into a small agricultural town in Washington State and opened the yellow pages, there was a section for pollinating, <laughs> pollination. And funny thing, there were companies there advertising their services as pollination specialists, and they would bring their bees to your apple orchard and charge you for the, for the privilege and uh, enhance your apple yield. So it, to me, that, that was the most telling piece of empirical evidence in that paper that you know, what's the externality here? Not only are they aware of each other, they're contracting with each other. And, you know, that's prima facie evidence that uh, there's no externality in my book. And then he, he went on with, with other he, – he collected some, uh, some data from a small number of beekeepers on what they charged for their pollination services and, uh, and you know, found that he thought markets worked pretty well. Basically, that the law of one price held that uh, – Pollination services sort of achieved some equilibrium price. So that was Chung's uh, uh, refutation of the fable of the bees in 1973. I think he was probably listened to more by economists than others because uh, what transpired at about the same time is we instituted a uh, honey subsidy program that one of the main, at least public arguments for, was it would – induce more beekeeping and increase pollination services, which we need more of. So apparently they weren't uh, reading Chung. Yeah. <clears throat> well, to come back to the discussions we've had of, of Ronald Coase in, in a number of previous episodes, the, the idea here is that when there are transaction costs, sometimes these external effects can be quite troublesome. Coase argued that therefore in those situations where there are transaction costs, they're sufficiently high – we should be worried about the outcome, and we might want to make sure we assign property rights carefully and see how the incentives play out in that case. But if property right, if transaction costs are low enough, that usually the parties themselves can solve the problem. The fact that Chung found these guys uh, 
these people selling their services suggested that the tra- transaction costs were not as low as as were not as high as as Mead and others had worried about. It wasn't a case where bees were wandering around and free and the Apple people were free riding on the bees. It was um, the actual facts were quite different. It's it's a beautiful example. It's very similar to the the lighthouse story uh, we talked about in the in the recent podcast podcast episode with Don Boudreau. Uh, about COSA's work saying, well, let's see how lighthouses actually work. They, you know, People say that they can't be provided privately, but they sort of were. They're not 100 percent. It's a comp- little bit complicated. But let's see what the actual facts are. And here's another beautiful example where uh, this, this naive – I'll call it naive blackboard economics where someone postulated a market failure. You know, the market – somebody figured out how to make it work. Yes, it, it's a great example of that and uh... – I think Coase inspired a lot of that kind of empiricism is looking at the real facts of the situation and how did how did uh, market participants on the ground devise ways to uh, create economic value, capture rents, uh, uh, contract with one another. That honey subsidy thing, though, strikes me as I doubt that a bunch of politicians read James Mead and said, hey, we got to help these people. There must have been some interesting public choice uh, political incentive issues there. Yeah, and I think the yeah I, I think you're right. I don't I don't think they did do a lot of reading of Mead and uh, and Bader, but it is true that in congressional debates over the honey subsidy, uh, the the externality argument was trotted out. And in fact, I clipped a quote from uh, President of the American uh, an American beekeeping group. Uh, who is uh, t- exhorting his members? He says, "He says I found out about this thing called a positive externality, and if we can really make all our elected representatives aware of this, I think we got this. <laughs> I think we've got him in the palms of our hands. Oh, wow. Something to that effect. So they weren't reading it, but I think, it, and and I don't really think that. Well, it depends on what your view is of the political economy of these subsidies. I think it's honey subsidies are pretty well explained by the concentration of benefits in a small number of." Uh, producers and the diffuse nature of costs uh you know stop stop a person on the street and say would you contribute a nickel for the welfare of beekeepers and bees i think an awful lot of people would say yes and if you aggregate all those nickels that turns into twenty thousand dollars per per beekeeper is that a rough measure of what the size of the subsidy was uh i'd have to go back and look at what we've written because uh, it's been actually a number of years since That's I've okay. looked at that. But yes, we'll, we'll put a link up to yes. it, and people can go find it for themselves if they're really worried about it or curious. Are the subsidies yeah, still in the place? Yeah, there's a Journal of uh, Law and Economics uh, paper on the honey subsidy program that uh, Rucker and Mary Muth and uh, and another author who's uh, Ted Ted Chuang we'll is put, the other author. We'll put a link up to it. Um, yeah. Are those subsidies still in place? They were they were killed, and now the the agricultural subsidy has shifted to crop insurance subsidies, and their and honey production is covered by subsidized uh, insurance to cover losses. So uh, there still is honey subsidy. It's it's not it's not large in absolute or even relative terms. I breathe a sigh of relief. That's few. Yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, you want to say anything else about um, the Mead, Bader, Chung stuff? Is there anything else interesting, Coast, that, that we didn't talk about? Um, well, I, you know, I think we, we covered sort of the, the main points. You know, in, in my view, this whole – the, the thing that Rucker and I have, I would say, if we've extended Chung's work, it's it's looking at how sort of modern agricultural markets have evolved and the whole migratory beekeeping thing. And it's just, it's it's a wonderful eye pencil story. I don't know if, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Leonard Reed's monograph, Eye Pencil, on sure. the coordination of unrelated individuals by markets. And, you know, this this is it. You've got people focusing on producing almonds who don't really know a lot about the you know, what it takes to be a beekeeper and and vice versa. And then you've got honey consumers, you've got almond purchasers in the rest of the world. All these people are coordinated by markets in in efficient ways. 
and that's sort of the marvel of it, the you know, this vision of a frictionless equilibrium, but then the, the nitty gritty of how it actually happens is all dictated by the transactions cost of contract contracting. I mean, here's one interesting thing just to sort of add to the property rights, uh, transactions cost theme is that beekeepers are producing two products, producing pollination services and honey. So they're you know, two output firms and the way they do their business is they keep the honey and they market that themselves. Uh, they don't keep the fruit that they produce with their pollination. They actually work as uh, contract laborers in renting out the services of their bees. And so here's a here's a contracting solution to a problem where you you want the ownership of the output to lie in the hands of the person who can most readily control the value of the output, and that's honey in the case of uh, the beekeeper. And it's fruit in the case of the farmer. So, you know, it's it's a it, the the contracting mechanism is is a particular Cosian solution to this property rights problem, and it's it's just fascinating. It's what, what makes the whole I pencil story work. Let's close with talking about technology because you mentioned a little bit about how the nitty gritty of, of what's happening on the ground and how these services get supplied. And do you have any idea of what's changed in the bee industry over the last say 50 years? Cause I think, I think most people would assume the answer is quote, very little, you know, the bees go out and they come back. But my guess is that, you know, one example you gave, my guess is a lot has changed. Uh, one example you gave was, um, the use of, of things to control mites that make the bees healthier. I bet there's breeding that's gone on maybe or other things. Um, I know the trucks that go to California from North Carolina have GPS. That's you know, that's a small thing. They get there mm -hmm. maybe a little more reliably. But has technology played a role in this really old – as old as there are – as flowers uh, and bees? It's It's a very old phenomenon. Has anything changed that's important? Well, I think there's this continual uh, arms race, evolutionary arms race against uh, parasites and disease that new forms of, of those develop and beekeepers develop new pesticides or management techniques or, or breeding. I was reading just this morning about Varroa sensitive hygiene breeds of bees that behaviorally will pick out pupae, uh, you know, the, the, the youngest of bees that have been attacked by Varroa, and they'll take them out and dump them out of the hive. So you want to breed bees that themselves will control the Varroa mites from inside. So there's a technological response. Uh, that's, that's probably the biggest example. In, in some sense, the technology is the same. Uh, as it was a hundred years ago in terms of the boxes and bees flying in and out. The other huge thing though that facilitates the whole migratory beekeeping and it's a, is public infrastructure and the roads. Uh, you can't, you can't have migratory beekeeping if you don't have a highway system. And that's why, uh, we've looked at evolution of markets. You don't, you don't see much contracting for pollination services. Prior to the 1920s, when passable roads became available, and you didn't see much long-scale migratory beekeeping until the interstate highway system. And and presumably in countries with poor infrastructure, their out agricultural output then is not quite as good. Although <clears throat> you might predict that those would be countries where they have horizontal integration, where they have to maybe learned how to have their own bees if they can figure that out. Uh, maybe they don't have time. It's it's not a, as you say. It's a purely specialized activity. No, I think you're right. There's a, a former student of mine is in India now, and I've asked her to find out what she can about beekeeping there. And there is there is integration of the sort you described. Apple growers will keep bees, but as India's agriculture and markets develop, uh, I think there's a sign of a growing growing uh, contracting for pollination. It's it's moving in the direction of more specialization and exchange. Is there any change in honey productivity? Is a is a hive of a is a colony of thirty thousand still produce the same amount of honey it did a hundred years ago, or is there any change there? 
they produce less. Certainly, a, a colony that's moved around to pollinate is specializing in the production of pollination during that part of the year that it's doing that. And so that kind of hive is going to produce less honey. So honey yields are going to be smaller on that. Um, I'm thinking of honey think per honey bee. Is, is there any change in honey per bee? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't think so. I think it, I mean, it all has to do with the health of the hive and what the hive is used for. I mean, you can, so I don't know what the trend is. You, um, bees get moved around not just to pollinate, but also to take advantage of nectar sources. And yeah, I, I, I don't know if I, I don't think it would be, uh, prudent to venture what uh, what the honey yield of a colony is now versus 100 years ago because you've got things you got this you've got the increasing importance of pollination that would reduce the honey yield uh, but you got the ability to move to alternative nectar sources and that management uh, method would tend to increase honey yield and I don't know how it would play out aggregated across all the I'm just guessing I'm just guessing that any health factors that they can improve they have and that might have some effect the beekeepers um but let's close just last question uh, what's the most interesting thing about bees we haven't talked about I i'm sure there's a hundred interesting things about bees we haven't talked about but just you can if you have one off the top of your head you can give me one because uh, i find it utterly fascinating yeah this is more about people than bees uh i am increasingly struck with how people uh how eager people are to believe doom and gloom scenarios about bees when there are some fairly straightforward facts you can look at that would disprove most of what is claimed uh but but people i, I there's something about human psychology that um they will pick up non-facts uh, about the bee world and, and run with it and assume that uh, there's going to be this cascade of uh, environmental catastrophe. And I, I don't I don't really understand that. I'd like to. My guest today has been Wally Thurman. Wally, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you very much, Russ. I've enjoyed it. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.